Okay, we're good. Sorry about that technical difficulties. And um, if you, I don't know who it is, um, Mrs. Zimmerman, but I think if you can mute yourself, there's like scratching. Um, then, um, so my name is Pat Harrison. I'm the owner and beekeeper at Harvey Beekeeping. Um, beekeep uh, Harvey Beekeeping is a uh, concierge beekeeping service where um, we, I keep bees mostly for people. So your bees, your honey, I'm the beekeeper. But um, so, but, but today I'm gonna talk about if you want to get into bees and be the, be the manager of the, of the bees themselves. Um, and we're gonna talk about, is beekeeping really right for you? Um, sometimes it's, it's not and people figure that out kind of thing. Um, so we're gonna talk about who's in the hive itself um, and kind of like a misunderstanding a lot of who actually occupies that, that hive. Then we're gonna go into the, the general and basic life cycle of an individual honeybee, an individual worker bee. And then uh, we're gonna talk about what's next. Um, what would what I have coming up in this series of, of classes. This is gonna be one of eight free online classes. And then there's three field days that are $65 per field day. Um, and then we're gonna, um, I'm open to answer any questions on, on basic any, anything because this is the, the first day. So who's in the hive? Um, there's really three classes or um, three groups of individuals that are, that are distinctly different. Um, you have the queen. The queen is the only fertile female. Um, she is the mother to all of the bees in the hive. Um, and she's there to be the mother of all the bees in the hive. She's uh, an egg laying machine. She's kind of the ovaries of the hive uh, to produce or um, to produce more of the workers. Uh, and then she also controls the pheromone and temperament of the colony itself. Um, the, the worker bees uh, that we have are non-fertile females um, and they do everything. They do everything from building the comb, uh, feeding the developing bees, foraging, um, the queen doesn't do anything other than lay eggs. Worker bees do everything. And then there's drones. Drones are the male bees. Um, they don't add to the production directly of the colony. Um, so if you were to remove all the drones from a hive, it's not gonna starve to death. It's not gonna fail. Um, but they add to the overall population of the, of the bees of a, like a, the population, meaning the bees in New Jersey, the bees in Bergen County, the bees in Vermont, that um, the drones go out and they mate with the queens of the other hives in the area. We're gonna talk a little bit about that though. So the queen in the hive, um, as you see here in the lower left, um, she's much longer, uh, almost wasp-like, no hairs, to be able to collect pollen. Um, that long abdomen stores all of the eggs that she'll lay in her one to three year lifespan. Um, and so you can, she's storing all of the eggs that she will lay in her life. Um, the worker bees kind of given her the room that she needs to lay those eggs inside the cell. Um, and the worker bees are constantly feeding her, uh, cleaning her, grooming her, um, making sure that the egg laying machine of the hive is well oiled. Um, now I say that, that she's the only fertile female and that workers are non-fertile females. That really means that they're genetically distinct. They're, they're the same, they have the same genetics. If I were to go into the hive and take the queen out, they will raise their own queen. 
And that's what you see here in the top right. These little peanuts are queen cells because this queen in the hive died. Um, she, she died for whatever reason it was, but they're out here trying to make their own queen because um, they can, because they can just feed the larva a different food, turn on some genes, turn off other genes, and then bam, you have a queen versus not feeding royal jelly and then you have a worker bee. Um, I can also take out an egg from one cell and put it into another hive that has no queen and they will raise my frame here that has 30 cells into 30 queens. I can manipulate the biology into making my own queens. Um, so it's pretty cool stuff that to understand that they're non-fertile females, you can do some cool biology. So like I said, workers do everything else. Um, the fact that they do everything else, that's gonna take up the majority of this talk. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, how um, a worker becomes a wax builder versus a forager versus a nurse bee um, right after I talk about drones. Um, Cause the worker bees are really most of what you're dealing with. Um, like I said, drones, um, they don't add to the direct production of the colony, but they add to the overall health of a good healthy bee population. Um, so part of a, you know, New Jersey, Northern New Jersey breeding program, maintaining good, um, a good amount of drones in your hives, make sure that your neighbor down the street has a well-mated queen. A well-mated queen lays many eggs. Many eggs on a frame produces a lot of honey. And so this box that's nine high really is probably eight boxes full of honey. It's probably 200 pounds of honey on each of these hives. Um, 2018 was, was an awesome year in this bee yard. Um, so I wanna talk about, we're gonna talk about the, the life cycle of, the, of that worker bee. Um, and the real importance of that um, is because there's really two life cycles that you, that you need to think about when you're managing a honeybee colony. Um, we're gonna focus on the individual bee today. And then Thursday is the, the seasonality of and the seasonal life cycle of a honeybee colony. So the honeybee colony being these set of boxes, how it goes from having nine boxes high to being two boxes high. And that's all part of the seasonality and the seasonal management of the hive. Um, and then there's the, the smaller, the individual bees life cycle that you also need to understand. And understanding the life cycle is, is extremely important. And it's kind of taken for granted that um, for other things that we would do. So it would be really silly for me to say that, you know, the roots of the tomato plant are in the soil that soak up water and then the leaves photosynthesize and create energy. The flowers turn into the fruit after it being pollinated. Like that's a really first grade example uh, because we understand the structure of a, a basic plant, but we weren't taught in first grade the, the basic structure of who's doing what in a honeybee colony. People say that the bee movie was good enough. It sure wasn't. Um, so as the individual goes, um, all insects have the four stages in front of you. Um, for the honeybee, it's an egg is laid by the queen in a cell. That egg hatches after three days, turning into a larva. Um, that larva would be compared to a maggot. If it was a fly, it would be a caterpillar if it was a butterfly. Um, but we call it a larva here. Um, 
worker nurse bees will come along and feed these larvae um, as they develop. They're a larva for six days. And then the worker bees on the outside, the adults will cover up the cell with the piece of wax. Then that pupa will spin a cocoon inside the cell that she's developing in. Um, this would be the, the chrysalis stage if it was a butterfly. Uh, maggots and flies have their own very quick stage um, inside whatever like corpse that a maggot is doing maggot stuff. Um, and then after another six days, she'll chew her way out as an adult honeybee. So if this was a butterfly, it, a caterpillar situation, it would be egg, caterpillar, cocoon, adult butterfly. But for honeybees, it's egg, larva, capped brood or pupa, adult honeybee. And this all happens within the same cell. Um, drones, queens, workers all have these three parts. As far as drones, queens, and workers, the only difference is really the timing that it, that happens. Um, a queen is a larva at, for only five days. Um, a drone is a larva for six and a half. Um, and I was very wrong. I said six days as a pupa or cat brood and it's really 12. Um, so this is a frame of capped brood. Um, brood is a term used for, for all, really all animals um, as like the young, um, the bird's brood um, is protected in its nest by its mother until it's hatched. And then it's even fed for a couple days. You know, the, the young bees, the, the young bees are brood and the, a robin would come and feed those, feed that brood that those fledglings kind of thing. Um, if it was a human, uh, the human brood stays at home until they're 25, until they're financially sustainable um, kind of thing. Um, so brood is just a term for really like young offspring. Um, and this frame here is all the capped brood, all the capped uh, pupa of workers. So that's like the, the quick life cycle of how they become egg to adult. Um, what we're gonna talk here, we're, like I said, I'm gonna go back to workers um, and talk about how the almost the division of labor within workers is part of their life cycle. Um, it's part of their life cycle and because um, age really has a big part of um, determining what a, what that worker bee is doing at, at that time. Um, so yes, genetics have some part of it, but um, the natural progression of time as it goes by um, makes, it will hatch, um, it will emerge as an adult bee, be a nurse bee, and then after a week or two, it will become a hive building wax producing worker bee. It will be a guard and then ultimately become a forager. Foraging is the most dangerous part of the job. Um, and that's where your bees are really gonna be dying kind of thing. Um, so understanding that it's a time thing um, is also really key because if I were to do something where I lock away um, the queen. So all of the adult, bee, adult bees age while not being replaced by younger ones, I will run out of nurse bees and only have older uh, wax producing guard and forager bees. And I'll have a deficit in, in bees to take care of the young. So we're gonna break down on, um, go, go into nurses. So um, 
I said what I was about to say. Um, nurse bees feed the larva um, from a particular gland right as they emerge. Um, the particular gland is that gland there. Um, you know, it's a ten dollar word. Um, so, and that's the that gland that it will turn off after two two weeks, uh, be making it that be unable to be able to feed larva. So a worker bee would go and consume pollen and honey, and then using that gland that it will secrete larva feed. Um, here in the top right, you have um, uh, your nurse bees feeding the queen, also fed from that uh, from that gland. Hive builders and wax producers. Um, wax is actually secreted from the, the abdomen of the bee. I was lucky enough to see that, which is pretty cool. So these little flakes here are little bits of wax. Um, after this photo, I touched the back of the bee and those flakes stuck to my hand. And um, so what would happen inside the hive is a, a bee would go over and consume honey and then start producing wax off of the glands in its back ab of the under abdomen. Another worker would come over pull that piece of wax off, they will manipulate it into the wax comb that you see here. Uh, left up to their own demise, bees would make almost the you know, honeycomb and honey frames, um, much like we what we give them. Um, but this was my, the photo that I was able to grab where um, you see here is the, the wax inside of a wall after Bees are, um, bees are, they were, they took up roost in this person's wall and uh, made a colony. And um, so they, um, yeah, they, you know, they, they produce that wax. So after the larva food producing gland turns off, the wax producing gland turns on. And then after a certain amount of time, that gland turns off and they'll become a guard bee. Um, so right here, you see two bees confronting a third. Um, well, I have arrows here. Um, and they're touching a ten eye and they're making sure that she belongs in this hive or at least making sure that she's coming back with a full stomach of, of nectar to, to add to the production of the hive. Um, and they wouldn't allow her in if she was empty handed and not from the colony that this is. Um, videos never work in presentations, so I didn't even bother. But after this photo was taken, they did fight because she wasn't part of the hive. Um, and it was a time of year, um, in it was late August when kind of like the drought season where there is no nectar. So a hive from down the street might rob the resources of a weak hive you know, up the street. Um, they would be able to rob the resources if there wasn't a sufficient amount of guard bees at the door kind of guarding. There's also a bunch of guard bees when you open up a hive. So there's a there's quite a few bees on the, the top bars of this of, of this of this box. Um, and then after just a little bit of smoke here, you can see that the, the bees kind of turn away and they go down into the frames. A second puff of smoke would push all of the bees down into those frames. So this was one puff of smoke, two puffs of smoke. Um, the smoke that you're using is diluting the alarm pheromones of the guard bees. So if you were to crack open the hives, they say intruder, go attack them, all right? But that smoke dilutes that uh, alarm pheromone, enabling you to kind of act invisibly. 
inside the hive. Forgers, there's three things that a bee is forging for. And this is actually where the genetic thing comes into play. And um, which is really important. If you were someone that's writing a lot of checks and you wanted to do a research project on the genetics of honeybees, um, it would be neat to see if you can breed bees to only forage for nectar and never pollen kind of thing, or same thing with water. It would, um, but the thought is, is that uh, queen mates with 20 to 25 drones, 25 males, stores that sperm and all the worker bees in the hive are all half sisters. So one group of half sisters only forages for pollen. One of the group of half sisters only forage for nectar. One of the half sisters only forage for water. And they really just focus on one thing when they go out in their lifetime. They do bring back what the hive needs. If it was a, you know, the hive is in a swamp where it's dry, or, you know, they don't need water in the hive. Um, you're gonna see less bees foraging for water kind of thing. Um, but there's, that's really where the genetic comes from. Inside the hive, um, pollen is brought in, pushed into the, the cells of the wax cells of, uh, of the comb and um, kind of fermented in a way to be able to be consumed by the bees themselves. Uh, like that protein needs to be adjusted a little bit. Nectar gets brought back and it gets dehydrated into honey. So nectar is about 80% water. Um, it gets dehydrated. There's some enzymes added that tur turns into 15 to 18% water. Um, and that's what we call honey. Um, if it was too high of a water content, it would ferment in a jar. And the USDA wouldn't call it honey if it was, um, I think over 25% water. Uh, water is brought back into the hive to cool it down. Um, so this is a hive on an extremely hot day um, after some boxes were removed. So this is a bit of an exaggeration. Um, but what these bees are doing actually are fanning water that are that was brought back and put into the hive loose into cells. And they're fanning that water, evaporating it off kind of the same way that we sweat. The water gets secreted from our skin and it evaporates off our skin. The bees are bringing water back into the hive and evaporating it off the hive. So um, this is kind of the, the next step thing. Um, Thursday, I wanna talk about the, um, the seasonality, the, the seasonal life cycle of the hive. Um, we, this is the kind of time of year that people need to get really thinking if they're gonna get into the hobby. Um, the, first, the first field day in April, um, I'm gonna have bees for sale, a nucleus colony. Uh, and that's something that we're gonna be talking about. Um, but if it's, this is something that you're thinking about doing as a hobby, um, as you learn, you kind of get to put your order in so that bees aren't sold out by the time that we're, they're ready kind of thing. Um, and other than fixing technical difficulties, I wanna hear your suggestions. Um, I uh, recently put the syllabus of the course uh, on the blog of my site so that it's always available. There's links to the suggested reading. Um, I'm gonna I put it, I created a suggested reading to start um, and that's gonna have kind of like a, like a before reading before I give a, a talk. Um, so when I come to the disease and pest talk for you to have read a little bit about 
um, what I'm going to talk about would allow me to go into it a little bit better. Um, so if you have some real grievances, definitely email me them. Uh, this is the, the suggested reading. The, um, the bee books all attached in the syllabus um, online. It's Keeping Bees um, by Malcolm Stanford. It's, he's a great guy. I, um, very good author. I think this book is broken down in a way where it's like really digestible, the, the information. Um, American Bee Journal and Bee Culture are um, monthly magazines. Um, they both have, they, they would both be norm, both normally be sending out uh, free copies to in-person beginner beekeeping classes so that there would be a stack for you to grab on your way home. Um, but instead, the American Bee Journal is offering a, um, April 2023 to, to everybody. Um, and that's also linked in the, the syllabus on the website. Um, and I kind of just want to note that this is a free class uh, because I do sell honey and candles online. Um, it's not just me right now. Uh, for now, it's uh, Manning is my store manager. He fulfills all the online purchases. Um, and with a, the great holiday season that we had, I'm able to offer this, this class for free. And I'm not, I'm not charging you um, right now kind of thing. So, and that's because of honey sales. Um, those are my two emails, both get looked at twice a day kind of thing. Um, and I kind of want to unmute you to ask some questions. I'm going to um, stop sharing, stop recording. And um, if you have any pressing questions, I'd like to answer them. Mrs. Zimmerman? Yeah. Yeah, I had talked to you before about um, do I have enough space in my yard? Do I have the right configuration? Um, I don't think my backyard is as large as your backyard. Um, is that something you would be able to come over and take a look and say, yeah, I think you could do it or maybe not, but you could still learn about beekeeping? Yes, because you're down the street. Um, and I, I can come and take a look kind of thing. Um, okay. But I, I'd i say that they keep bees like their air conditioning units in Brooklyn, uh, hanging out of windows. Um, and so the, the, there's just some adjustments that you would do if you are dealing with tight quarters kind of thing. Um, new beekeeping regulation, I don't think for a new beekeeper has a to the fence line. Um, there's, you would have to set up a, uh, like a, um, a flyway barrier um, mm -hmm. if you're you know getting close to the fence kind of thing. Um, and that's something that I'm gonna talk about in the third lecture, which is gonna be on the 18th. I'm going over um, the New Jersey beekeeping regulation keeping bees in populated areas. And then we're gonna talk about the equipment. So I was using words like frames, boxes of bees, things like that. And um, I, I know that's a bit of jargon. It's kind of hard to not use the jargon and, and explain. So it's kind of like a time where it's like tough. <laughs> um, but on the 18th, I'm gonna talk about the equipment and the, um, keeping bees in populated areas kind of thing. So to address the peoples that aren't down the road that I can help. Okay. Anything else? Um, I'm gonna send an email out. Uh, did any, anybody not get the email? Um, if anybody didn't get the emails that I sent out, um, send something to me so that I can put you on the list so that you can get the proper links. And um, for Thursday, six o'clock, 
I'm going to make sure things are squared up 100% so I don't not show up to my own class and show up somewhere else virtually um, and um, kind of have like a, a, I subscribe to a system where I can send you out a blast kind of thing. So if you didn't get those emails, make sure you send something to me. Um, and if you were to think of a question that, you know, comes up now, or later, or you have a question, yes, you can ask that question. You can just unmute yourself. Hi. Hello. Hi. Okay. I have a quick question. I do live in an apartment and my plans is to buy a house because I want to do the honey and also I grow microgreens. Mm -hmm. I like both. So for example, but I was reading if I buy uh, one acre, how many I can have, how many bees I can have in one acre? It's, it's go by location, go by zip code, by zone. I, I didn't read the syllable, so I don't, I, I'm sure you're gonna, I don't know. If yeah, it's a, it's a real sliding scale towards, uh, I'm pretty sure at one acre, you can keep 12 hives. Okay. Uh, and then under a quarter acre, you're only, you're limited to two Four. hives. Okay. And then between that, it's like, there's a, there's a, it's like based down, based down on like every quarter acre. Um, and, th and that's go under like a farm, the farm taxes, you don't know. Oh, so when you get into farm taxes and stuff, well, um, you like need a B -B more B -B than five thing? acres. Oh. Well, yeah. So if that's a complicated thing. Yeah. You oh, need okay. two years of revenue. Um, so I'm protected under farm assessment because I make enough revenue and I have two years of it to, to be a farm, even though I'm not managing okay. land. And um, it's... It's its own presentation. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, that's why. Because I always um, look, uh, uh, because I know uh, you. I need to check with the neighbors because if the bees fly, they fly, uh, you know, you need yeah. to, there's a whole thing. So I'm like, if I have a, if I buy one acre, how many can I have? Like a. Yeah, you can, you can have, you can have too many on one acre. It, but you like can or it's, cannot. you can yeah and it's okay. it's weird yeah um, yeah okay no it's just you know we're gonna yeah. get there i was just wondering for how many acres is in new jersey you know yeah okay and i i wish i'm still working out with metropolitan farms um i'd like it so that um you can you can sponsor a hive kind of thing where i i'd manage it and then like, and manage it for you somewhere yeah. kind of thing. Um, still working on packages like that, where because you're in an apartment, um, you know, you don't have a place to put it. Can you get bees in April and then move them to your new house in June? Um, because I've been managing them from April to June is something that I, I would hope to, I hope to, you know, pan out and have have ready for you know, somebody like you. Um, you know, definitely before spring. Yeah, um, because I'm planning to move out this apartment in September, and mm -hmm. I say I'm gonna buy a house. Cool. I'm doing microgreens. I'm gonna do the bees, and I'm doing this. But I'm like, cool. how many acres can you have a by law? You know. Yeah, I don't it's, know if it's yeah, a that, law. Um, they'll, that third they'll, presentation they'll is where we're gonna have, we're gonna talk about that. Um. I also oh, okay, okay. including in the um in the email that I'm going to send out is um is going to be a closed Facebook group. So I have Harvey Beekeeping uh, Facebook group uh, Facebook page where I I'm selling honey. I'm trying to sell candles, kind of thing. Uh, this Facebook group that I'm I made is um is for beekeeping questions. So instead of me getting a beekeeping question through email and answering that person through email, um, if I were to answer your question, then you know Aaron doesn't learn from that question kind of thing because that would probably be something um, that that she didn't know and then I answered kind of thing, you know. Um, and then I'm gonna be posting into it so like you know tell me you know take a picture of your hives and you know trying to keep you involved with it 
the whole point of the structure of this class is that I found that there's a lot of issues, even with some of the best speakers in the state, um, giving some of the best B talks in the state for two days in February. And then you buy your bees in April and then you're off to go um, kind of thing. My point is here is I wanna kind of string you along and keep you involved for the entire season. So that come September when you're managing bees and don't know what you're doing kind of thing because it's your first year um, and that's totally reasonable. Uh, I'm here to help out kind of thing. So um, that'll be all in your e that email blast. So is that it? If you can find it. All right. Does everybody like this kind of time? Almost 40, 45 minutes. I thought that was perfect. Uh, made it Thursday. So, um, so the next time is Thursday. So if you were to have a glass of mead, it's still kind of the weekend. Um, so, all right. Uh, are they all on Thursday? All classes aren't Thursday, correct? Yeah, so it's all gonna be, yeah, the, the rest are gonna be on Thursday. Okay, I do have a question. Um, let's say if you like, you don't want to buy uh, bees or like start your own thing, um, but you kind of just wanna learn and then maybe like be an apprentice or like work for another farm, do they, would, would people like hire people, but like, I don't I mean, have that experience. So like, how, how does that work? I, um, I'm, I'm not hiring kind of thing. Um, right. the, the field days that I'm going to be mm. having, um, you don't, you don't have to have bees at home to, to join those field days. Right. Um, so you'd be totally welcome to it. The point of those field days is um, the three times a year, you're gonna come to my apiary. I'm right. gonna show you what to do in my apiary and then you can go home and do it in your own bees. You don't no, have right. bees but, what if, but what if I want to like get more hands-on before I, I take that step? Are there like other, do you know like other people who are like, do the people volunteer? Do people like- So there's, there's me though. Sorry. Um, there's Mevo Earth, just typed it into the chat. Um, they're a not-for-profit organization up in Mawa that, mm -hmm. that have a couple hives. Mm -hmm. um, they, they do volunteer work. Um, if you were, they, they have a, a summer internship where it's like three days a week mm -hmm. where the, you can probably get into bees. Um, other than them, I'm not completely sure. Okay. Um, and as of right now, it's only three field days. I mm -hmm. hope to do more for more people kind of thing. So like if those field days, I'm going to limit to like 15. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be tight and it's going to be you know, intimate where mm -hmm. um, other days I'm going to have you know, bigger groups kind of thing, so. Okay, all right, cool, thank you. So if that's it, um, I'm gonna head out and end this meeting. So I'll be posting the recording of this and emailing you um, probably tomorrow morning. So thank you for coming. Thank you, have a great Thanks. night. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick.